If you've got your Bible with you, open with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. We we'll spend some time now worshiping the Lord in our giving. You know, we do these things on purpose, and, and like Sarah said, we're, we're new to this. We're, we've been in ministry a while, but, uh, you know, until you've pastored a church, you've never pastored a church. <laughs> it's kind of like people ask, you know, single people, what's it like to be married? Or even married people ask people with kids, what's it like to have kids? And I always laugh when people are like, well, you need to get a dog. <laughs> That's not like having kids. <laughs> Whoever told you to get a dog because it was like having kids did not have kids. Until you're married, you don't know what it's like. Until you got kids, you don't know what it's like. There is no replacing that experience. And we are quickly finding out, too, as long as we've been in ministry and around church and in churches, until you've had one of your own, until you've pastored one, you've never pastored one. I know that's deep. Am I too deep this morning? Come on, church. It ain't that early. But Sarah's right. You know, we're, we're new to these things and excited about walking in these things, but we, we have, the, to the best of our uh, ability to hear from the Lord, we're endeavoring to structure these things the way he leads us to do it. And we spend time in singing and praise and in worship, but do you notice we put these testimonies, these glory stories right in there as we're worshiping the Lord. Why? Because that's worship. That's worship. To take time out and say, God, look at the good things you've done. Look at how faithful you've been. And what other people's testimonies are supposed to do is stir faith in you. Come on, are you listening? What God's done in other people is supposed to stir faith on the inside of you because he is no respecter of persons. And what he's done in them and for them and through them, he will do the same thing for you. All he requires is faith. All he requires is faith. And that's the reason we take this next step in our worship service and we put our offering right here. Why? Because this is worship. This is glorifying God. So let's do that together this morning in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. I want you to look at verse 5 with me, and we'll read a couple of verses here together. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. I like these first few words here. Thus says the Lord. Does he have your attention yet? That ought to grab our attention. We should want to know what he says. Thus says the Lord. Cursed, oh boy. Well, we're off to a rough start. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. He said the one who trusts in man is cursed. Cursed? Really? Here we are in the 21st century, still talking about curses. Is this stuff real? Because you got a lot of the rest of the world that says, I don't believe in all that stuff. Cursed. Somebody who thinks they're cursed. Well, the Bible talks about it. We're reading about it right now. It may not be what people think it is. Let me use another word here that I think will help, help make some sense of it. And I think it really means the same thing. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. How about I say it to you like this? Perpetually frustrated. Constantly frustrated. That's what it is to be cursed, right? I mean, what is cursed? Somebody thinks they're cursed when nothing they do works. When nothing works out, when nothing works to their benefit, and it just seems like everything they do falls to pieces, they step back and say, man, I must be cursed perpetually, constantly frustrated. So who is it that's cursed? Who's constantly frustrated? It's the man, or you know that means the man or the woman, the person who trusts in man. The person who trusts in another person solely, that person will be perpetually and constantly frustrated. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Notice this next line. Whose heart departs from the Lord. There's the real problem right there. Whose heart departs from the Lord. 
Well, if you departed a place, that means at least at some point in the past, you were present. You were there. He said, cursed, constantly frustrated. Nothing ever works out for this person. Nothing ever produces anything good for this individual. Why? Because they put all their trusts Trust in another person. They're leaning on flesh as their strength. And flesh would include anything in this seen world. Anything you can touch, anything you can feel. That would include another person. That would include another system of this world. That would include the government. That would include the bank. As long as your trust is in something you can see, you are destined to be perpetually frustrated. And the big problem is this person's heart has departed from the Lord. Meaning at one time, they trusted in the Lord. At one time, he was their strength. Cursed. Notice what he says in verse 6. He says, he'll be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. Like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. You don't want to get to this place in your life where good's coming to you and good's coming by you and you are so frustrated with things that are falling apart around you. You don't even see when good comes. You don't even recognize when good opportunity comes. He said, the man who trusts a man, he's like a shrub in the desert. He doesn't even see when good comes. He will inhabit parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Verse 7, though, listen to this. Blessed. It's getting better. Started off cursed, but now we're talking about somebody else. Blessed. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Blessed. Somebody shout it out loud. Blessed. Now, let let me tell you something right here. Don't you, for a minute, Let religious thinking make you feel guilty or bad or condemned because you're believing God for the blessing of the Lord. There are those that have big problems with us and this kind of message that talks about the blessing and they try to make it off like we're greedy and selfish people. Folks, I'm just reading Bible. He said blessed. He said blessed. Blessed is the man who, who does what? Trusts. Now, he could put anything right there. He could have required anything he wanted to right there. You want to be blessed? Then then check these boxes. You want to be blessed? Then do this hundred things, and then we'll talk about maybe blessing you. That's not what he said, though. Blessed is the man who trusts. This is what he's asking for. This is what he's requiring. Because this is what pleases him. This is faith. Faith is trust and trust is faith. And the blessing of the Lord is attached to you doing this one thing, trusting him. Trusting him. Now, why would the blessing be attached to that? Because trust is a heart issue. Don't lean, the Bible says, on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust is from the heart. Blessed is the man who gives God his heart, who loves him with his heart, who trusts him with his heart. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Verse 8, for he will be like a tree, not a shrub, a tree. He'll be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. You notice the, the, the contrast here between these two people. You got one who trusts in man, right? One who trusts only in what he can see, only in what he can feel, who trusts only in what makes rational sense, trusts only either in his own experience or somebody else's. But the result is you end up like a shrub in the desert, dry, no water, nothing to feed you. But in contrast, you've got somebody else who trusts the Lord. And this guy's not cursed, he's blessed. And he's a tree, not a shrub. I'm looking at a bunch of trees this morning, am I right? Not a bunch of shrubs. Trees. Trees that are planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and do not fear when heat comes. 
The guy couldn't see, the shrub in the desert couldn't even see good when it comes. But this, uh, this guy over here, he didn't say heat's not coming. He says, you just don't fear it. Amen. Heat's coming. The pressure's coming. The pressure's on. But you and I can live in such a way that we do not fear it when it comes. Say amen. amen. But your leaf, he said, will be green. You will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. See, now you're crossing over into something supernatural, something miraculous, because trees bear fruit for a season. A tree, even one that's alive and even one that's producing, it has a season of bearing fruit. But here you cross over into this supernatural fruit bearing where you don't even stop. Fruit's just coming and coming and coming and coming. Somebody say fruit. Jesus talked to us about this in John chapter 15. And he said it over and over and over in just a few verses. He said that you would bear fruit. My father's glorified that you bear fruit, that you bear much fruit, that you bear more fruit. And he said it over and over and over again. And we've talked about this some before, but let me remind you, why would Jesus be so emphatic about you and I bearing fruit? Why would this be the picture the scripture uses, that we bear fruit? Well, if you think about it, the fruit that's hanging off the branches of the tree is proof of what kind of tree that is, right? Fruit hanging from the branch is evidence, it's proof. It's proof that a seed got sown. It's proof that the seed took root. It's proof that it sprouted up. It's proof that it grew and it grew and that there was so much life in it, that there was so much nutrients feeding it that eventually it overflowed in fruit. And that's why you don't walk up to a tree with a bunch of apples on it and wonder what kind of tree it is. You don't have to wonder, do you? There's proof. Again, what do we say to a world that's telling you, prove to me there's a God? I'll be your proof. This is why we've got to be bearing this fruit. This is why we've got to be ha having the, the fruit of the Spirit hanging off every branch in our life because love, the love of God in our life is proof. Proof there's a God. Joy in your life is proof there's a God. Peace in your life is proof. You want to be the guy in the desert? You want to be the one planted by the water. You want to be the shrub in the desert? You want to be the tree that doesn't stop producing fruit. You want to be that tree. But notice how he, he started it. Blessed is the man who does what? Trusts. Trusts. This is the key to it right here. Trusting the Lord, trusting him with all your heart, leaning not to your own understanding. And the big problem with your own understanding is it will only get you as far as you've ever been. At the very most, it'll get you as far as somebody else has been. But there are places that God wants to take you and I, places that nobody's been. Show us things nobody's seen. How do we get there? Huh? How do we get there? How do we get there in our families? How do we get there in this church? We don't get there by figuring it out up here. We get there by trusting in the Lord with all our heart. Now, it's one thing to say, Father, I trust you. But trust is demonstrated. Trust has to be proven. And the biggest way you trust somebody is you take something that's precious and valuable to you and you put it in their hand. That's evidence of trust, right? There are not very many people that Sarah and I are willing to just leave our kids with. She and I have been traveling together since we got married. And when we had justice, we were still on the road ministering. And Jesse came along. We're still out on the road ministering. And there were times we took them with them. There were times we're traveling internationally. And we have to find a place to put these kids for a few days. Well, you know, we didn't take out an ad. We didn't post something online, babysitter wanted. Why? These are the most precious things we have. And we don't just put them in any old hands. There are those we trust. There are those we trust and we take what's valuable and precious to us and we put it in their hands. You can't stand here and say, oh, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. And then have this white knuckle death grip on your wallet, your checkbook, your bank account. Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? Take what's precious to you. 
take what's valuable to you, put it in his hand. That's trust. Now, I know a lot of you came in here this morning ready to give. You've got an offering. You're ready to sow. But I was thinking about this. You and I both know I, we came ready to give. We're in a season right now. Just be honest. Could you think of something else to do with what you brought today to put in the house of the Lord? I mean, is, is there something else that it could go to? You got Christmas. You got bills. You got things that need to be taken care of. Is there something else it could have gone towards? Sure. Something you need, something you want. But when you put it in the hands of the Lord, you're saying, I trust you with this, and I trust you to take care of everything else. It's trust. And this is what he's looking for. Our prosperity is built on our ability to trust him for it, and then him to be able to trust you with it. Thank you, Lord. God's been doing good things around here. Uh, let me give you the quick report on the building project. Most of you know by now we've been uh, in faith together on this place. And look, we're open. Glory to God, we're open and you're here and we're here. This is the grace and the goodness of God. We've released faith together in this 30,000 square foot facility for $100 a square foot. And we are coming so close to the end of this project. Last week, I reported to you, we had 28,706 square feet complete. That was 95.69% just in the last seven days. You ready? Another 210 square feet have come in. That puts us at 28,916 square feet. We are flirting with 29,000 square feet complete here. That puts us at 96.39%. Guys, it was not that long ago. It was not that long ago. We had none of this. There was none of this. And we were just looking at a three... Uh, a 30,000 square foot need, that's all it was. But we released faith together. We took a step of faith and partners, people joined us and they sowed in faith. And look what God has done. And if he can get us to 96.39%, what do you think comes next? 97, 98, 99, 100, 110, 150. Come on, I'm saying this to stir you up about your own stuff. You got stuff you believe in God to do? He's called every one of you in here to buy up and build out something. Not to stand still and certainly not to go backwards, but to progress in faith. And if you know what that is, well, this is a good place and a good time to sow because every seed reproduces after its own kind. Uh, if you brought an offering this morning and you're ready to give, if you need an envelope for cash giving or credit card giving, raise your hand. Our ushers have one. They'll get one to you. Uh, if you'd like to text your offering this morning, you can do that by texting LEGACY and any dollar amount to the number 28950. If you're watching online today and you'd like to give online, you can do that at LegacyChurch.Family. There'll be a couple of options there for you. I know we've got a lot of people watching online today. Uh, like Sarah said, you braved the roads to come. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Lord, for getting us here safely today getting us home safely today. Glory to God. But if you are watching online this morning and you want to be a part of the offering, you can do that. When you're watching online, there's a place where you can designate. If you'd like it to go to the Buy Up and Build Out project, you can designate that there. If you don't designate it, it's going to go into the general operations of the church, which is great as well. So many good things going on there and some great outreach coming up. We're excited about it. Uh, if you're looking at the envelope this morning, you want to designate it, you can. There's a place. Just follow those instructions. Thank you, Lord. Everything you need is right there in front of you. If you're making a check this morning, you can make it payable to Legacy Church. And then wherever you'd like to see that offering go, whether into the general operations or the buy up and build out project, just designate that somewhere on your check. Take a moment and fill that out. Sarah, would you come please and bring our offering? Anybody else interested in not living a cursed life? Let me give you another good definition for what it means to be blessed. When everything you set your hand to do prospers. That's the blessing of the Lord working. The cursed man, doesn't matter what he sets his hand to, it just seems to fall to pieces, can't make anything work out. And if that's been going on around you, take a minute and ask yourself, where's my trust been? He said, cursed is the man who trusts in man. That would include you trusting you. 
So if, if things just don't seem like they're, they're working out or panning out or producing anything, find out where your trust has been. And man, you can change it in a hurry. You can change it right now. And just say out loud, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. And as you sow today, just say to him, here's my proof. Here's my evidence. I trust you. And I sow in faith and I sow in love. Why don't you stand up with us and let's worship the Lord with our giving. Thank you, Father. You've been so good to us, so faithful to us. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we worship you today with our offerings. You have been good, you've been faithful, and you have brought us so far. And Lord, with joy, we return it to you with faith and with love. We offer this to you. We ask you to see it. We ask you to receive it. We ask you to open the windows of heaven above us and pour out a blessing so much, so rich, so strong that there's not room enough to contain it all and we have to find somebody else to be a blessing to. Lord, we thank you for the good work you've begun in us. You have brought us miraculous, miraculously far in this project. And Lord, we can see the end. It's in sight of this part of this project. And Lord, we'll, we'll be quick to give you all the praise and all the glory as you cause us to finish and finish strong. Now, Sarah and I come into agreement with each other and with this congregation. And we declare the blessing of the Lord over them. We say, rise up, advance, and may the goodness of the Lord be seen in your life. May God multiply you and increase you, you and your children. We call you blessed in Jesus' name. We call you blessed in Jesus' name. And when we look at this church, we see a room full and overflowing with blessed people, healed people, strong people, people who love God, people who love His church, people who love to give and love to sow, generous people. We call this place blessed in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father. I want you to say this out loud after me. Say this, we are prospering in every area of our lives. Spirit, Spirit soul, soul, and body. And body. We, sow we sow in faith. We, in faith. we, reap, in we reap in joy. We will have, we will have more, than more than enough to meet every need, to, meet every need, to, pay, every debt, to pay every debt, and to be a big blessing <laughs> to a lot of people. We're not running out. Come on, you need to say that again. We're not running out. What about this Christmas? Are you running out? No. What about as we wrap up this year? Are you, not, are you running out? No. Well, what's going on then? If you're not running out, what's happening? We're running over. Say it out loud. We're running over. And just like Sarah taught us a moment ago, begin to expect that. Wake up every day expecting that, looking for it. I'm going to see the goodness of God today. He's going to show himself strong to me today. And you know you believe it when you're excited about it. When you, when, you, uh, when you got that hope, and that's not just wishing, that's expectation. Something good is coming to you. We've got a friend in ministry. He's a little bit older than us. He says, man, I, he's kind of a country guy. He says, I, I, I got reverse paranoia. I think everybody's out to bless me. <laughs> you need to wake up with some reverse paranoia. Everybody's out to bless me. Glory to God. Father, we worship you with this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, you can wait on the people. If you brought your Bible, go with me this morning to the book of John chapter 10. And I want to look at something we looked at together last week. We have got a word from God. Let me try that again. We have got a word from God. Now, if you're not actually excited about it, don't give me a fake. No, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for the real deal. When I say we've got a word from God, let me remind you what that means. We're believers. That's who and what we are. We are believers, not doubters. We're believers. But when you call yourself a believer, I guess the next question is, okay, well, what is it I believe? Who is it I believe in? And one of the big things that we as believers believe in is the Word of God. We believe His Word is Him speaking to us. We believe His Word is not just 
printed words on a page. Man, this thing's alive. The Word of God is living. It's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. What's it able to do? To divide asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Other books can't do that stuff. This one can. I said, this one can. We're believers in the Word of God. And as we're coming to the end of this year, this church, this family, this ministry, and we are a, a global family. It's not just this local church. We're a local church that's got a global call. And we've got partners in this ministry with us, with this family all over the world. God's given us a word. And what we use his word to do is set the tone and the expectation for the future. That's a big part of what his word is and what it does for our lives. And regardless of what we're experiencing or may, may, or, not, may or may not be experiencing in the moment, we've got his word to help set an expectation of where we're headed. This is one of the big things that defines us and makes us different than the rest of this world. We can actually be bold about the future, even though we've never been there. I've not yet been to tomorrow. Can I see the hands of those who have? If you have, we'd like to hear about it. But you haven't. We've not yet been there. And that, that realization alone is enough to just scare people out of their minds. They don't know what the future holds. But this is one of the things that makes us different. Even if we don't know all the details of the future, we know our God is good, and we know he's got a plan for us that's good, and it's not evil. We've got a hope. We've got, an, we've got a future. And we can live, we can li even if we don't know, we can live with the confidence of somebody who does because we know him. And we know he's got us, praise the Lord. And we've got a word concerning our future. And Sarah mentioned this to us a moment ago, but let me remind you what that word is. I believe that as this year is coming to a close, you know this, there's nothing magical or mystical about one year flipping the calendar page to the next. But I do believe we can use this time, and the Lord is using it for us in this body, as a point of contact to recognize the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. And what I believe the Lord is saying to us is this is the end. Just like 2020 is coming to an end. And I know there are people out there saying, praise the Lord, amen. It couldn't have come any sooner. I mean, this is what we needed. But I'm going to remind you something. This stuff doesn't go away because you flip a calendar page. The hardship or the challenge that many people have faced in this past year, it doesn't magically stop because you flip from December 31st to, to January 1st. But you can use this as a place to set your faith, just like this year is coming to a close. I'm declaring it in Jesus' name, so is sickness and disease. Anything that's hung on to you, anything that's been prolonged, I don't care if it's sickness and disease, I don't care if it's poverty and lack, strife in your home, whatever it's been that's just hung around too long, it's time to look at that stuff and say, you're coming to an end. You are coming to an end in my life. I put up with this for too long, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. It's coming to an end. And let's just use sickness and disease as an example. If there's been something that's been hanging around in your life, your body, your family, and it's been around there a long time, it's time for you and I to step up and say to that stuff, you're coming to an end. You are coming to an end in my life. This is the end of sickness and disease, and it's the beginning of life more abundantly. This word right here for 2021, life more abundantly, needs to set the tone of our expectation. What are we going to see in this coming year? What are we going to experience in this coming year? I don't know what all it is, but I do know this. It will be life more abundantly. Life more abundantly can take care of a bunch of stuff. Life more abundantly can heal the body. Life more abundantly can restore the marriage. Life more abundantly can put food on the table, can put money in the bank. Life more abundantly can pay off a church building. Life more abundantly can pay off your home 15, 20 years early. Life more abundantly can do that stuff. 
That's the expectation we have in this coming year. In John chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and may have it how? More abundantly. I have come that they'd have life and have it more abundantly. I know this isn't one of our traditional Christmas scriptures. I know it's not Luke chapter 1 and 2, and we're well into the life and ministry of Jesus. But this is just as much the Christmas story as anything regarding his birth. He's telling us why he came. I have come, one reason, that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. I like the Amplified Bible that says that you would have and enjoy life to the full until it overflows. We were singing about that just a moment ago. I'm living in this overflow. This is the kind of life Jesus came to give us. This is what his birth was about. This is what his life and ministry was about. This is what his death, his burial, and his resurrection was all about, was that you have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? This is the kind of life that Jesus came to give us. He said it again, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they have life and have it more abundantly. Go to the book of Psalms with me, chapter 23. The 23rd Psalm. We're going to come back to John 10, but listen to this from Psalm 23. Verse 1, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And because of that, I shall not want. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. What does he do? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now what's he doing? While you're lying down in green pastures, while you're there resting beside still waters, what's he working on? He restores my soul. There are things happening here, and the picture that's being painted is of what it means to have the Lord as your shepherd in every area of your life. You know, we talk about this a lot, prospering in every area of your life, spirit, soul, and body. When the Lord's your shepherd, how much do you lack? You lack nothing. Why? The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, if you're a sheep and you're looking at green pastures, you happy. <laughs> this just made your day. Green pastures, that means we can eat and eat. That means every need is met. And if you're a sheep, you don't have that many needs. Food and water, baby, that's what you're looking for. But he uses this as, a, as an illustration to prove to us and to show to us, demonstrate to us that when the Lord is your shepherd, there's nothing you lack. There's nothing you want. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me. Notice this. He leads me. He does what? He leads me. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me. There it, again, there it is again. In the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, he goes right back to this picture of you sitting down eating. The sheep are eating in the green pastures. That's you, that's me. As he leads, if he's leading, what's that mean we're doing? We're following, right? And this, the whole rest of this psalm is about what you find as you follow him. He leads me. And if he's leading, I'm following. Where's he leading me? He's leading me to a table that he prepared for me. Friends, God can set a table. God can set, he can flat set a table. 
And, and we know this, that everything grace has to offer, he has put on that table. That's this table we're reading about right here. And it's not some table off in heaven in eternity. He said he's prepared a table for you right in the presence of your enemies. Now, when you are in the middle of a fight, and it could be a fight for your life, the last thing you're thinking about is, I could eat. <laughs> but how much faith does that demonstrate? To say, I know what's going on around me. I know the fight that I'm in right now, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a seat to this table that my father has prepared for me, that he has set for me, and I think I'm just going to eat. I think I'm just going to enjoy myself right here at this table. And you're looking at everything that grace has put on the table. I mean, grace has put salvation on the table. And grace has put the healing of your body on the table. And grace has put the prosperity of your life, spirit, soul, and body, and relationally in every area. It's all right there on the table. Now, what would you think about somebody if they came to your house for dinner? We got Christmas dinner coming up, so let's use that as an example. And you got family and friends coming, and you are working, working, working day and night to prepare this table. And the clock's counting down. They'll be here in just, a, just an hour or so, and you're sweating, and you got it all on there. And then finally, as the doorbell rings, you put the last fork on the table, and ta-da, it's ready, right? And you open the door, and here come the people. And they come in there to the dining room, and they look at this table you've prepared, and they say, wow, look at this table. Oh, look, it's beautiful. You did beautiful. It looks so good. And what do they do? They start walking around the table. Look at this table. Oh, that looks delicious. That looks so good. I'm so hungry. That looks amazing. And they look at you again. You did awesome. You are so good at setting a table. This is beautiful. And for the next hour and a half, they walk around the table, commenting nonstop about how good it looks and what a great job you've done, and what a good cook you are. And then they look at their watch and say, well, thanks for having us. We got to go. What do you do? You stand there. They all file out one by one. The door closes. You stand in there with the table still perfectly set. Nobody touched anything. Now, as the one who prepared it, does that do something for you? Does that make you feel good? Are you happy with that? No, you prepared it so that they would do what? Sit down and eat. Quit talking about how good it looks. Sit down and eat something. See, grace has set the table, but it's faith that sits down to eat. Grace sets the table, faith eats. I learned that from Sarah Hart Pearson's. Grace sets the table. Faith eats. You've got a shepherd. You've got a shepherd who's leading you to green pastures, who's leading you beside still waters. You've got a shepherd who's leading, and if you will follow, he'll put you, this scripture said, on the path of righteousness. You will lead me in paths of righteousness. He said, you prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Does that sound like abundance? I came that you'd have life and have it how? More abundantly? You don't want me to tell you the definition of that word abundantly. It will make you so mad. Religion doesn't like to hear it. You want to know what it means? The word abundantly literally means excessive, too much. And you got most of the rest of the religious world that would like to tell you that's the problem. The problem is people and their excess, too much, too much. They want too much. No, the problem's not excess. Excess is the kind of life Jesus came to give. The problem is not knowing what to do with it. That's a big problem. We'll talk more about that as the Lord leads us. But listen to this. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. That's excess. 
That's you standing there holding the cup, Lord, and the Lord just keeps pouring and pouring, and it's running out over, over the cup and over your hands and onto the table and onto the floor, and you're going, God, that's enough, that's enough, it's full, it's full. And he's going, shut up. No, here, take some more, take some more, take some more. This is who he is. This is what he did. Abundance is his nature. It's in his DNA. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You look up some of these words in the cross references here that he says, I will return to the house of the Lord. I'm just going to keep coming back. I'm coming back to the house of the Lord. You know what? That's what we're looking for too. Just some people who will keep coming back. I just, we just want some folks who'll just keep coming back. Just give the Lord some opportunity. We just need some folks who'll be patient with us as we learn, as we grow, as we grow as a family and as a body and as a church. Just keep coming back. But why do you keep going back to any place? Because you find something there that you haven't found somewhere else. You get a hold of something in that place that you've decided, I can't get this anywhere else. This has what I need. And the, and the psalmist says, I keep coming back to the house of the Lord. I just keep coming back because that's where that table's set. Because there my cup overflows. I keep coming back to the house of the Lord forever. But I want you to make note in this psalm how many times he talks about leading us. And then specifically what he said about putting us on the path of righteousness. In the book of Psalms here in the 65th chapter, look at this with me, Psalm 65. 65, 11 says this, you crown the year with your goodness. I like that. I like that as we, we look at a new year coming up here. You crown the year with your goodness. When you think about this or even look at some of these words, to crown, we, we know the, to, to place a crown on somebody. But the crown itself is a representation of something. It's round. And when the crown sits on the head of a king or a queen, it represents their authority. It's 360 degrees. It's their authority reaches all around them. And when the scripture says, you crown the year with your goodness, you could say it like this, you surround this year with your goodness. Wouldn't you love to be surrounded by the goodness of God for all of 2021? Just surrounded by it. And everywhere you look, you see nothing but the goodness of God. You experience nothing but the goodness of God. And that's not to say you don't face something that's hard or challenging. It's just to say that you know what to expect even in the middle of it. You, you go back before the Lord and you say, Father, you promised me you, you would crown this year, my year, with your goodness. Surround me with your goodness. Notice what he said, though. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. What's abundance? It's too much. It's excess. It's overflow. You crown the year with your goodness. Your paths drip with abundance. That tells us just the residue of where God's been, the path, the path that he was on. Some of these words are interesting when you look them up. It literally means the trench. I think one translation brings out this, that the, the tracks of your chariot drip with abundance. Where he's been. So let me ask you this morning, does it matter in life what path you're on? Does it make a difference? Or can you just pick one? Huh? We're reading, we read in the 23rd Psalm about the paths of righteousness. Here you find out that the paths of God drip with abundance. Now, other places in Scripture tells us that there are ways that seem right or paths that seem right to a man, but the end is death. So knowing that, knowing that one path leads to life and one path leads to death, does it matter what path you're on? Yes. Yeah, it matters what path you're on. If one path leads to light and one path leads to darkness, does it matter what path you're on? 
If one path leads to abundance and one path leads to lack, does it matter what path you're on? It absolutely matters. And he said, here, your, your paths, Lord, nobody else's, yours, they drip with abundance. But check this out, verse 12, they drop, those paths of abundance drop on the pastures. We just read about the pastures. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. Does it matter what path you're on? So go back to John chapter 10 now where we began already and what Jesus said about abundant life. If it matters what path you're on, I guess the next question to ask and answer is, how do you get on the right one? How do you find the right one? The book of Proverbs tells us that the path of the just is like the shining sun. What happens on that path? It's getting brighter and it's getting brighter. And it's getting brighter. Every, every step you take on that path, it's getting a little brighter. And it's getting a little brighter. That is so different than the way most of the rest of this world lives life. Fumbling around in the dark. Stumbling in the dark. That same scripture goes on to say, the wicked don't even know what make them stumble. Just tripping all over everything. And call it living. Just call it life. Well, you got to figure some stuff out, some things you know, some things you don't. You make some mistakes. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> That's not a scripture. <laughs> you don't have to stumble around in the dark. You don't, have to, you don't have to take the wrong path for 10 or 12 years only to find out it was the wrong one and then backtrack and stumble around trying to find the right one. You can find the right path. You can live on the right path. And that right path, according to Jesus, is the path that leads to abundance. Life more abundantly. So that's John chapter 10, verse 10. Let's just back up a few verses and put this verse back where we found it and, and take a look at the context of it. Jesus is speaking here in John 10, verse 1. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door by the, uh, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name. And what does he do? He leads them out. Out of what? Out of whatever it is they're in that they need out of. Jesus is the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name and he leads them out. It says in verse 4, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes, before, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus is speaking here, talking about the fact that his sheep and what makes his sheep his sheep is that they know his voice. They know his voice. Now remember, we're, we're just a couple of verses away from I've come that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. And we're asking this question, does it matter what path you're on? And if it does, then the next question is, how do you get on the right one? Well, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. What did the psalmist say in the 23rd Psalm? He leads me. He leads me into paths of righteousness. What I'm wanting you to connect the dots in this morning is that he leads you by speaking to you. And we come to a place in our lives where we know his voice. You got anybody in your life? that you know that voice, you recognize that voice, even if they're not standing there in front of you, you hear that voice and you, you know who it is immediately. Have you ever, this would be back in the days before caller ID, but that they used to have phones that would hang on a wall <laughs> and they'd have these cords that hung from the phone and you would walk until you ran out of cord. That was the ancient, archaic, right? 
Well, back in the days before caller ID, the phone would ring and you'd pick it up and hello, and somebody on the other end would go, hey, it's me. Now, either you know that voice or this is about to be a really awkward moment. And you probably did the same thing I did. Somebody said, hey, it's me. But instead of just going, oh, I'm sorry, who's this? You feel the pressure to be like, hey, hey, you, how are you doing? And man, you just hope that they'll talk just long enough, right, till they'll drop some sort of clue and you, oh, okay, I know who this is. You know, you broke, broke out into cold sweat. But then there's those other people. When they say, hey, it's me, there's no question, right? You know that voice. Like if Sarah were to call me on my phone, for some reason I don't, I don't recognize the number she's calling from, all she'd have to say is, hey, it's me. There's no need for her to reintroduce herself. <laughs> Jeremy, hi, this is Sarah Hart Pearsons. You, you and I met... Uh, 13 years ago, we got, I don't know if you remember, we got married, and we have a couple of kids. That, oh, hey, Sarah, yeah, I know you, hey. Wow. There's no need for reintroductions, right? We're past that point. We're at a place in our relationship where I know that voice. And you've got people in your life, you know that voice. But do you realize that there is a level of intimacy available to you and your heavenly father, where all he has to do is call and say, hey, it's me. And you recognize it. You recognize that voice. You don't stand there wondering, is that God? Is that me? Was that my flesh? Maybe it was the devil. Folks, if we can't tell the difference between Jesus and the devil, we're confused. We are really confused. And that's what this verse in John 10 is all about. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. What's Jesus saying? Don't get us confused. Don't get us confused. He's the one that came to take life. I'm the one that came to give it. Don't get us confused. But what he connected all this to was knowing his voice. He said, my sheep know his voice. Know my voice. That's what makes us his sheep. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8 that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In other words, this is a defining characteristic of being a son of God, of being one of his sheep, is that you know his voice, that you're led by that voice, right? So you have to ask this question, and this is what makes you look crazy, in the eyes of the rest of this world. When you show up and you say, God said to me, do you realize, now in here you can get away with that. In here you're around a bunch of people that are like, yes and amen. Out there you got people that go, what now? You think God's talking to you? you sorry, let me just understand. You think, are you hearing voices? Is that what's happening here? You, you, God said this? I mean, how many times have we seen this? Immediately, people think you're crazy. They look at you funny because you say you heard from God. Are you hearing voices? You can say, no, just one voice. <laughs> Not voices, voice. The voice of my good shepherd. And they can call you crazy, but this is one of the defining characteristics of the life of a believer. That we believe he speaks. We believe he speaks, and then I'll take it a step further. We not only believe God talks, we believe he talks to us. Let me take it one more step than that. We not only believe God talks and that he talks to us, we believe we can understand him. We believe we can actually fellowship with him. And we believe that as he speaks, he leads, and as we listen, we follow this is how you find the path. He's directing you to the path by speaking to you. Back in 2008, January of 2008, Sarah and I had just gotten married in September of 07. And uh, in the beginning of the next year, 
I remember we were getting ready to go into our services. We were youth pastoring at the time, and Wednesday night was our, our youth group night. And Sarah was leading the worship, and of course I was teaching, and we were getting ready for church that night, that little rental house that we were in, and uh, she was going to be leaving the house early to go for band practice and rehearsal to get ready for worship that night. And I was seeking the Lord and had been for a few days, Lord, what do you want me to say to these teenagers? We're starting a year, what do you want them to know? What do you want to say from your word? And man, it came up strong in my heart to talk to them about hearing the voice of God. To talk to the young people of the church about how to hear the voice of God. How many think your life would be different as a teenager if you knew how to hear the voice of God? Well, they're not too young. They're not too young to hear about these things. And so it's coming up strong in my heart. But every direction I started to take, it just didn't seem quite right. And, and the Lord would say, no, back up, back up. And I think, well, okay, this is how you hear it. No, back up. Well, this is what you do to hear it. No, back up. And I mean, the clock's ticking. It's Wednesday night. It's just a couple hours before service, two or three hours. And I'm, I've got to be ready to say something. She's getting ready to go. I'm praying about what do I say, God, about how to hear the voice of God. Really intense about it. But you know what I kept getting in my heart? Don't let Sarah drive tonight. She was going to leave early in her car. I was going to meet her at church later. Don't let Sarah drive tonight. And I thought, okay, well, if I take her, then it's a 15-minute drive there. It's a 15-minute drive home. That eats up good study time. And I got to know and teach about how to hear the voice of God. <laughs> so I just kept pushing that aside. And I heard it once, and I heard it twice, and I heard it again. I remember standing in the door of the garage, opening it for her, and as she's backing away, don't let Sarah drive tonight. Well, God, I would take her, but I got to go figure out what to teach teenagers about hearing your voice. This is important. She pulled off and drove away. Ten minutes later, my phone rings. She's been in an accident. And I jump in the truck, and I'm flying towards her the whole time, kicking myself, right? Don't let Sarah, I wonder what that mean. Was that me? Was that God? Was that my spirit? Was that my flesh? Don't let Sarah drive tonight. Now, thank God he was so merciful towards me. Let me tell you what happened. We had this long straight of way between our house and the church. And you get on it for, I don't know, six or eight minutes or so. Just a long straight road. Had some hills, but just long and straight. And as she's coming up over a hill, we have in Texas what are medically referred to as rednecks. And this one, one of these guys <laughs> were, was in his truck, and he's at a stop sign that's uh, perpendicular coming into the road that she was on. And she's coming up over this hill, but this one guy in his truck who, oh yeah, also be ha happened to be towing another truck with this yellow strap that he had tied in a knot to his bumper, tied in a knot. Sorry, I feel like I gotta tell you this story like this. See what he did now <laughs> is he done tied this yellow strap, yeller, to the bumper of his truck, you see? And he thought he could get out before her. He pulls out. She's got no time to break. Goes straight through that strap between two trucks. And I get to the scene and the trucks are pulled over. She's pulled over. She drove a little Volkswagen at the time. I remember walking. There were some, a few little pieces kind of scattered in the road. And the, that little VW emblem on the front of the car and the grill was laying out in the middle of the road. I went and I grabbed that thing. I have it at my house to this day. You know what it reminds me? God talks. Every time I see it, I'm reminded, God talks. The question is, are you listening? Because it matters what path you're on. One leads to life. One leads to death. One's got abundance. One drips with abundance. One is a constant struggle full of lack and pain and heartache. Does it matter what path you're on? God talks. God talks. 
And that's what the Lord said to me to tell those teenagers that night. You remember I said he kept saying, back up, back up, back up. And had to come all the way back to this question, does God speak? Does he speak to us? Yeah, he does. I got proof. <laughs> this little VW. Glory to God, she was fine. She was fine. But that was the Lord being merciful on me. He was gracious towards me. I'll tell you another story about that same stinking road. I couldn't have been more than 19, 20 years old. And the youth pastor that I served at the time at our church wanted to have a lock-in. You know what these are? These are straight from the pit of hell, these things. <laughs> Somebody says, I've got an idea. Let's get 120 teenagers, put them all in a room, and stay up all night. Nothing bad will happen. So he wants to do this lock-in. I made it as long as I could. I was serving as a volunteer. And so I go to get in the car to go home. And I will never forget this. I reached out to grab the handle of my car door. And these are the words I heard. Not, just, not out loud with these ears, just on the inside. This is what I heard in my spirit. Don't listen to secular music tonight on the way home. It'll be the difference between life or death. You know how you can hear something from the Lord and, and it kind of takes a second to say, but you get it all in one second, one moment of time? Well, I was tired. It's the middle of the night, tired of screaming young people, and I'm going home. And my thought was, I'm going to get in the car and turn something up as loud as I can to stay awake for the next 15, 20 minutes. But that just came up in my spirit. Don't listen to that. It'll be the difference between life or death. So I get in the car. And I'm digging around for something to listen to because I'm on the verge of sleep, as it was. And I found this one CD of this Christian band. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Like really aggressive rock. I really wasn't that into it. And I don't totally know what I was doing with that CD. But I found it and it was Christian, so I was going to put it in. I put it in, turned that stuff up to keep me awake as I drive home. I'm not a quarter mile from that exact same spot I'm telling you about with her car years later, I'm coming up over one of those hills. I'm in my lane, and up over the hill comes another car in their lane, and another car passing that one in my lane. So I've got two cars headed right at me. Folks, I don't know what happened. All I know and all I remember was being safely on the side of the road just a second later untouched, no wreck, no accident, shaking a little bit. And all of a sudden, I'm listening to the words that are playing on my stereo. You want to know what that guy was singing? I will never forget it. He was singing a song that went like this. I'm not going to sing it. I'll give you the words. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I've got someone to watch over me. Now, he was screaming it. But those were the words. Come on, does it matter what path you're on? How do you get on the right one? You listen. You listen for the voice of your good shepherd. And we get to the point where we think, God, all, all these external things, well, this must be God talking. This thing over here, that must be God talking. Well, this bad thing happened, that must be God trying to tell me something. Well, this car wreck happened, that must be God trying to tell me something. That doesn't say anything in there about God leading you with all that stuff. It says he talks. It says he speaks. I saw somebody online not long ago that said, I think they'd been in an accident and this other bad thing had happened, this other bad thing had happened. And she's like, oh, God just keeping me alive. And somebody wrote back and said, girl, I think God trying to kill you. <laughs> People are confused. They don't know what's going on. He leads us by speaking. Does God talk? Yes. The next question is, are you listening? Can you hear his voice? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Jesus can pick up the phone and call his sheep and say, hey, it's me. And they know exactly who it is. But I like this in verse 6 of John 10. Jesus used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Can I just tell you briefly how much that encourages me as a minister? To realize that even Jesus said some things that people just looked at him like, huh? What? 
So he went on to explain a little more in verse 7. He said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out, listen to this, and find pasture. All of this comes back to you being fed, finding pasture. He leads me in green pastures. The paths, your paths drip with abundance and they drop on the pasture. All of this is a picture of every need being met, but not just met. Notice what he said in the very next verse. The thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. This isn't just about a need being met. This is about being met to the full until it overflows, excessive. This is the kind of life you and I have been called into living, this excessive life. And I know that sounds funny to religious ears, but again, the problem's not the excess. The problem is you don't know what to do with it. The problem is we don't know what it's for. But Jesus came to give you so much life to feed you and to keep you so fed that, it's, that it fills to the full, it overflows, and then you're saying, God, give me somebody to give this to. Is there somebody I can give this same life that you've given me? The abundant life isn't just about you looking at the bank account and seeing seeing a big fat stack of cash sitting there and thinking, okay, everything's good. I see that. That's not what the excess is for. It's about you being so blessed, spirit, soul, and body that you say, God, you have got to give me somebody that I can give this to. The excess is where your ministry starts. That's where your ministry begins, when you find somebody to be a blessing to. Does it matter what path you're on? I mean, do you want, you want to have a ministry? You want to be, live the kind of life where you have not just every need that you have met, but there's more than enough and you're able to give to every good work that you always having all sufficiency might have in abundance to give to every good work? You desire that? You got a few in here that do? Okay, well, let me talk to you for a second. (laughs) The rest will catch up. If you desire that, it's because God himself put that in you. That's not on the inside of every person, but it is on the inside of the believer who's been given life. In turn, they want to give it. They want it to be an overflow. Give me somebody to give this life to. What I want you to see this morning is that there is an inseparable connection between life more abundantly and hearing the voice of your good shepherd. I don't know why sometimes we do this, but we take scriptures that are literally sitting right next to each other and preach one thing about this one and something else about that one. But John 10, 10, check this out, comes right after John 10, 1 through 9. These things are connected. There is no abundant life apart from you hearing the voice of your good shepherd, hearing his voice, recognizing his voice, following his voice. Jesus talked in several places, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, other places. He, he talked about those um, who, who heard but didn't hear. He said, well, did the prophet Isaiah say of you, seeing you see, but you don't perceive. Hearing you hear, but you don't understand. If you've got teenagers, then you know there's a difference between somebody hearing your words and then somebody like actually hearing your words, right? Forget teenagers. Ladies, if you're married to a man, you've experienced this before, (laughs) right? Here's the guy, it's Sunday afternoon, football's on. He's locked in. It's a great game. And here you come. You want to say something? Hey, babe, can I da 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 And he gives what I call TV face, right? This is TV face. It's where the, the head turns. <laughs> the head turns, but the eyes never move, right? And he thinks that you think he's hearing you. Now, there may be sound falling upon his ears, But help me out, ladies. Is he hearing? 
What about, what about a, a young person? What about a teenager? You know, you're talking to them and you can just see that look, just that glazed over look. And it's like, you ain't hearing a word I am saying. There's a difference between words falling on your ears and you actually hearing. And when Jesus said that, in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it was the parable of the sower. He's preaching this parable, and then the Bible says in the book of Luke, he cried out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, everybody out there that day heard him, but precious few heard him. I don't know of another way to say it. Everybody heard the words, but very few heard the word. There's a difference. And he said, the prophet Isaiah said of you, you see it, but you don't see it. You hear it, but you don't hear it. He said, your, eye, your eyes, you have closed. You did it. You closed them. Your ears are hard of hearing. Somebody say, open my ears, Lord. Do you desire that? You want to hear his, I want to hear his voice. I want to hear his voice. There's, there's nothing we can't have. There's nothing we can't do. There's nothing we can't accomplish individually as families in this church family if we'll just hear his voice. Because if I hear his voice and then I recognize it and then I follow it as he leads with it, I'm on the right path. Where's this path taking me? Huh? This path is the path of righteousness. This path is the path that drips with abundance. This path is the path that gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's the path I'm going to be on. If you're looking for me, I'm on that path. Is that where you are? You want to get on that path? Learn to hear the voice of your good shepherd. Let me give you two big ways I believe the Lord speaks to us. Number one, by his word. By his word. Can I see the hands of those in here who own a Bible? Okay. Then don't ever again, as long as you live, say that you don't hear the voice of God. Don't ever say you can't hear him. Never again. You want to hear the voice of God? Open the book. Set your eyes on his word. Man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's what fellowship is built on. That's what lasting relationship is built on. It's words. The preciousness of words. Maybe you've heard me give this example before, but when Sarah and I first met, we didn't live in the same state. She lived hundreds of miles away. I was in Texas. She was in Missouri. But I've told you pieces of the story before. The Lord's doing a quick work. We knew before we ever met each other that I knew she was the one I was going to marry. And I came to find out later she knew I was the one she was going to marry. We'd never met. It's a good story. I'll tell you someday. <laughs> but the entire time we dated, we never lived in the same place. We never lived in the same state. There was always hundreds of miles between us. And the week that I met her, Wednesday night, March 7th, 2007, I met Sarah Hart. And I, it was done, man. I was, it was over for me. I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> but I was only in town there for like three days. And we spent every waking moment of those three days together. But I got to get on the plane and go home. Well, guess what I did just as soon as I got home? I pick up the phone. I call her. And we start talking, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked that night, and we talked the next day, and the next night, and the next day, and the next night. And for weeks on end, it, it was not uncommon to stay up all night on the phone with each other. And all we had were words. That's it. But it was building something. And it was different than any other relationship I'd ever been in. In other relationships, you know, it, when it's new and it's fresh, you just got all these feelings and this excitement and this, this spending time together. And those things are fine and they're good, but we, all we had were words. We couldn't even be in the same room. We couldn't be present with each other. We just had communication. And here I am getting to know this girl 
And our, our love story is so fast. We meet. Three months later, we're engaged. Three months after that, we're married. But I knew this woman because I spent six months listening to her and listening to her and listening. And there were times we were together, but it was for short periods, and then we'd be apart again for weeks on end. But we had words. We had words. And as much as I missed her and longed to be around her, I'm, I'm thankful that at least in the beginning, the relationship was built on communication and the words that we shared with each other and not something else. It wasn't physical. It was what was being revealed through our words. And I'm just grateful we had phones. I mean, all you got to do is go back a couple of hundred years and it would have been letters. <laughs> My darling Sarah, how I long for thee. I'm just thankful we could at least speak to one another over the phone. But what I'm telling you is fellowship and relationship. You don't come to that, hey, it's me relationship without a lot of words. And we don't live on bread alone. We don't live just on God's provision. We live on his word that makes provision. There's no abundant life apart from hearing his voice. There's no green pasture without him leading you there by speaking to you. There are no still waters without you following him. That stranger's voice, Jesus said, his sheep won't follow. Whatever's strange to you, whatever's foreign to you, you won't follow it. But what's familiar, you will follow. God speaks to us by his word. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our does it matter what path you're on? Yes. If the path is dark, then you're on the wrong one. If you get over here on the right path, it's bright because his word lights it up. Thank you, Lord. He speaks by his word. Another main way I believe the Lord speaks to us in addition to his word is by his spirit. One last verse and we'll wrap it up. John chapter 16. Notice what Jesus said in verse 13. He said, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. God speaks to us by his word and he speaks to us by his spirit. I want you to quit in this coming year looking for these external things to lead you. Just because a door opens doesn't mean God opened it. But how many times do people say this, oh, it's an open door. God must be saying this. God must be saying that. Well, this one closed. Well, God must be saying don't. Or he might be saying knock. Or he might be saying, fight. How do you know? If you're going to be led by external things, you're going to be misled all the time. The only way to end up on the right path, the path that leads to abundance, because that's where we're headed. 2021, life more abundantly. The only way to end up on that path is to know his voice, to hear his voice, to recognize it, to follow it, don't you long for that relationship with him where he calls and he says, hey, it's me. And you don't go, hey, hey, you. Who is this again? No, you recognize it. You got history. You got a, fr you got a fellowship and a friendship that's built on his word. Amen. He leads and he speaks. He does it by his word and he does it by his spirit. I want you to stand up with me. And I want you to say this out loud. God talks, God talks. And, I hear his voice. and I hear his voice. Jesus is my good shepherd. Jesus is my good shepherd. He, calls he calls me by my name and he leads me out. He leads me out, he leads me out, he leads me out of whatever I need out of. <laughs> he leads me out of sickness. He leads me out of poverty. He leads me out of lack. He leads me out of depression. 
He leads me out of strife. But he also leads me in. I hear his voice. I recognize his voice. I follow his voice. And he leads me in to abundance. He leads me in to prosperity. He leads me in to healing. He leads me in to peace. I know his voice. I am his sheep. I recognize his voice, and I follow. Can you put those words in your mouth in these coming days, in these coming weeks? Don't wait till 2021 shows up before you get a vision for it. You ever seen two people race each other, but one of them got a running start? Does that change the outcome of the race? If you got one that's got a running start, what is that? That's momentum. We got, what, three weeks, something like that left? Three and a half weeks before we get into a new year? How about we go into it with a running start? How about some momentum? Let's let some momentum build right now. And get these words coming out of your mouth all the time. In this coming year, I know the voice of my good shepherd. He calls me by name. He leads me out from day one of this year. I hear his voice. I know where to go. I know what to do. I know who to do it with. I know what to be a part of, what not to be a part of. I see it. I am filled with the knowledge of his will. How? Why? He speaks to me. I hear his voice. Does God speak? Uh Uh-huh. Does he speak to you? Yes. Can you hear it? Uh Uh-huh. Can you understand it? You bet. What am I doing? I'm getting a running start going into this year, recognizing the voice of my good shepherd. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the good work you're beginning and have begun in this church. We call you faithful to finish it. We thank you, Lord, for the good things you've done, the great things you're doing, the greater things that are yet to come. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Father, for the upcoming year. Lord, we know that as this one comes to a close, it's the end of one thing and it's the beginning of something else. It's the end of sickness and disease. It's the beginning of life more abundantly. It's the end of poverty and lack. It's the beginning of life more abundantly. It's the end of strife. It's the end of bitterness. It's the end of brokenheartedness. It's the beginning of life more abundantly. And we thank you, Father, that you do speak to us through your word and by your spirit. And as you speak, we will hear it. We'll recognize your voice. We will follow your voice wherever you lead. And by your grace and by your help, And by the leadership of your spirit, we will always be in the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Looking at a room full of people who hear his voice. A room full of people led by his spirit. You notice I keep saying that? A room full. A room full. I call this room full and overflowing in Jesus' name. Well, how's it going to fill up? you got to tell somebody. All right? Can you do it? Glory to God. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for what he's doing in our lives, thankful for what's coming up. We bless you this week, declaring good things over you. We can't wait to see you again next Sunday. We love you guys. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.